Good morning, everyone. So as Graham was saying, um, you know, we know that genuine democratic elections rely on fair competition, on faith in electoral processes and electoral institutions, and on informed and inclusive participation. However, uh, the deployment of false or manipulated or disorienting uh, information in the electoral environment um, has been uh, undermining uh, some of these principles uh, in countries around the, around the world. We've seen it increase voter confusion, um, galvanizing social cleavages, skewing playing fields um, for political contestants, suppressing the participation of women and marginalized people, um, and really damaging and degrading trust in democratic institutions, and in some cases, the electoral results themselves. While disinformation campaigns and elections are not new, um, we've seen you know, propaganda and disinformation for decades and decades, um, particularly in semi-authoritarian and authoritarian countries. Advances in information technology has made them much more effective, essentially increasing the speeds and distances and volumes that information can move around elections that are unprecedented for every cycle before it. At the same time, digital platforms can improve the way people receive electoral information, reaching citizens where they are with valuable voter information, um, increasing access to and the quality of open election data, improving communications and efficiencies between and among stakeholders and constituents, and providing an alternative avenue to speak truth to power when more traditional outlets fail. Those who are working to support credible elections, oops, sorry. Uh, those who are working to support credible elections are adapting to a new environment shaped by digitization, which includes new and often transnational actors like tech companies or PR marketing firms, and threat drivers that are often a lot less transparent in the online space. It also means shifting and expanding timelines and skill sets to meet evolving tactics. This panel will explore the fundamental links between digital trends and electoral integrity, and we're joined by panelists that are working on elections occurring in their own countries um, this year. And they represent a, a variety of different perspectives, from watchdogs to administrators and regulators and beyond. So what I'd like to do first is introduce our panelists, and then I'm going to um, do a round of questions with them to kind of kick off the discussion. And then we'll open this up to a uh, Q&A. Um, and we'd really you know, welcome your all's participation in the discussion as well. So first, I'm pleased to introduce Ellen Weintraub, who is uh, a commissioner for the Federal Elections Commission of the United States. Next, um, Vukasava Chernyansky, who is the founder and executive director of the uh, Center for Research, Transparency, and Accountability in Serbia, uh, better known as CERTA, which is an independent nonpartisan civic organization committed to democratic culture and uh, civic activism. Uh, next, we're joined by Caio Machado, who's the director of Instituto Vero in Brazil, which brings together researchers and digital influencers to build a healthier and more sustainable internet. And finally, we have Anis Somali, who's an elections and civic expert working with NDI based out of Tunisia. So first, I'll start with Commissioner Weintraub. Um, can you give us your perspective on what you've experienced and had to address in the States? Um, how has social media and online campaigning sort of changed the way that we think about political and campaign finance around elections? And when we're really thinking about the upcoming midterm elections in the United States in November, um, where have you sort of seen improvements uh, in transparency and accountability, for instance, related to political ads? Um, but also, you know, where would you like to see um, more change? Thank you, Julia. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you to the Atlantic Council for inviting me. Uh, as Julia said, we've got uh, 21st century technologies that are an overlay on democracies which have existed. I, you know, you can go back to Athenian democracy, but in my country's case, uh, we have a system that was created in the 18th century. So now we're trying to adapt 21st century technologies to an 18th century creation of this uh, form of government. And um, 
The, uh, I'm, I'm really struck by the title of this conference, Contested Realities connect and, and Connected um, Futures. And I wonder if those two concepts are really compatible, because I think what we have seen in the United States is um, a real degradation of the ability to have a shared set of facts from which we could then engage in informed political debates about what what do we do to address the problems that are addressing uh, that are affecting our country. Um, digital technology has really um, uh, had an astronomical effect on the on the political ecosphere, on the information ecosphere. In 2016, it was you know maybe two to three percent of advertising in politics was done online. By 2020, it was up to 18 percent. So that's a pretty steep rise. This year, who knows? I think this is clearly the wave of the future for conveying information. After all. Who actually watches legacy television in real time and sits through all the commercials, right? That's not a very effective form of advertising. So it's not surprising that this is where the um, this is where the trends are going, and um, perhaps the uh, philosophy of. Um, uh, moving fast and breaking things is not, again, something that is terribly compatible with democracy, which is not something that we want to break. And yet it is under a lot of stress because of the virality of, information, of, of the information that gets transmitted. And that is what's new. It's uh, propaganda, as Julia said. There's nothing new about propaganda or disinformation. We've, it, it goes on on cable news. It goes on through tabloids that, you know, again, date back to the early days of our republic. But it is the ability to spread like wildfire that uh, really changes the dynamic when you're talking about the internet and social media. Just yesterday, there was an indictment handed down uh, against some groups in the United States for a seditious conspiracy to try to overturn the election, and they organized on social media platforms. Not perhaps some of the better known ones that, uh, that uh, we've heard from here at this conference, but uh, still, social media can be this incredible force for good, uh, and the internet for uh, spreading information. I remember in the money and politics field how excited everyone was when politics first started to take advantage of these technologies. And people thought this could be a huge advance in preventing corruption. You wouldn't need these vast sums of money. You wouldn't need to go hack, hat in, the candidates wouldn't need to go hat in hand to big donors and ingratiate themselves and become indebted to large moneyed interests in order to get their, their message across because they could just come up with a great idea and it would spread like wildfire over the internet and they could really catch hold and have a very cheap and effective campaign. And that can happen and it has happened, but we have also seen less good information, conspiracy theories, provocative and outrageous content that also spreads like wildfire. And the one thing that we don't want to set on fire is our democracy. So what can we do about this? Well, I think, as some earlier speakers have said, this requires a whole of society response. I think that um, we at the FEC have bizarrely been struggling for over a decade to try and update our rules on how to provide information how to provide disclaimers that will tell people where the ads are coming from, where the information that they're seeing online is coming from. And it was a sleeper issue when we first started. But then around 2016, when we started to see the Russian government spreading disinformation to try and affect our election using these social media platforms, suddenly people got very interested in who was um, behind the information that they were seeing online. And there was a, a renewed interest in trying to get this done. Somehow those efforts have still faltered. But while I have been arguing with my colleagues at the FEC and trying to persuade them that, yes, you can fit a disclaimer on an ad, even if it's only shown on, on a mobile phone, that the versatility of this technology should be an enhancement to providing greater information about where the other information is coming from, the tech companies actually stepped in and said, hey, we got this. And they 
they showed us how easy it is to actually provide that information, to provide these disclaimers. Facebook does these little wraparounds where the information goes outside the ad, so it doesn't take away from the messaging opportunities. Uh, and Google has similarly uh, come up with uh, solutions for their platform. So in some ways, the technology companies are ahead of us in government in uh, providing better information, and I appreciate that. What I appreciate less is the way their algorithms rhythms are sometimes seem to be designed to promote the most provocative and perhaps unreliable content. And right around the election uh, in 2020, they changed their algorithm. Again, I'm just going by what I read in the New York Times, but reportedly they changed their algorithm in the, in the short period of time around the election to upgrade and promote more credible sources, more reliable sources of information, and to downgrade how uh, the spread of information that was less reliable. But they only kept that up for a short amount of time. And, I, and then they switched back, because you know what? They found out that people were less engaged, they stayed on the platform less time, because the information was not so provocative. Um, so, I would like to see the platforms be, take a more responsible position about trying to ensure that the information that they are spreading, again, as uh, somebody smarter than me has said, freedom of speech does not equal freedom of reach. They're the ones who are providing the reach, and they don't have to provide that vast reach to every crazy conspiracy theory that is out there. Uh, Congress could take steps to improve the disclosure, again, of who is behind all of the information that we are seeing on, uh, online, and there are several bills that have been introduced and unfortunately are stuck excuse me, in Congress and don't seem to be going uh, uh, anywhere, anywhere fast. Uh, and circling back to my own agency, because we need to take responsibility for our role in all this too, there is a, uh, another issue behind this that goes behind the technology. We can provide these little disclaimers. We can require that people provide that information to the public as to who's behind the ad, but often what they get is the name of an organization that nobody's heard of before and no one knows who's behind it. And we knew a need to do a better job of opening the, the sunlight on these organizations and providing better information to the public and ensuring that people do know who is behind the money, who is behind the advertising that is trying to affect our democracy and our elections. Thank you, Ellen. <clears throat> and one thing I would note about that is, is you know, these kind of measures that have been taken around um, U.S. elections to try to respond um, to some of the information that, that is occurring around elections and to try to amplify more accurate sources. Um, you know, that's also not something that a lot of social media platforms have been able to commit to in countries all around the world, right? Um, and so that's a, a challenge that remains. Next, I'd like to turn to, um, to VUCA. Um, I know as part of CERTA's kind of broader election monitoring initiatives that you've been monitoring both social and traditional media. Um, you know, in your opinion, how, how did the information environment really kind of shape the April elections um, in Serbia, and you know, have you seen things kind of tactics changing or evolving, and 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 you know, does this have any kind of implications for the broader region? Well, thank you, Julia. And um, I'm mean, like listening to you. I realize how far away we are from your position. You know, like especially when we come to regulation. Uh, I'm here actually to remind all of us how traditional media is still so power, especially for the societies and environments who didn't or don't have a living experience in democracy. So I'm coming from Serbia and we are facing a serious backslide when we talk about democracy. So as I mentioned, no living uh, experience in functional democracy, although uh, we say for ourselves that we are a democ democratic country. Uh, but international organizations now uh, recognize us as a hybrid regime, that we have hybrid regime, some semi-democracy. And uh, I would say that uh, just for your uh, um, you know, like understanding uh, the environment, uh, to give you a, a, a few sentences about the Serbia current situation. Uh, we are facing a, a centralization of power, so everything is concentrated in the president position. Uh, no, or like a lack of separation of power. Then we actually see a serious failure of institution when we come to protecting the, the rights or the, uh, the, the public interest or democratic capacities. 
Um, we are facing a lack of pluralism, not just in media, and I'll talk about that, but in public sphere, you know, like in, area, in any area where you would uh, expect that there is a pluralism, we actually face the uh, constant government attempt to marginalize or eliminate uh, uh, critical, any critical voices. And so, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, with no living experience, we are lacking actually demand side coming from citizens, you know, like to uh, actually fight for media pluralism or, you know, like democratic uh, institutions. So this is one of the major obstacles. And then when we come to this in information environment that you uh, mentioned, and I, as I said, lack of pluralism, um, the thing is that Serbian society is actually oriented toward the, the traditional media. Yes, I mean, like only online media is important, and they're like more and more increasing, you know, like when we are talking about getting information, but the traditional media is still so influenced. And then comes the questions, you know, like what we do when the, the uh, you know, like disinformation are so much, you know, like spread at the main. Uh, mainstream media, traditional media, and the main source is actually the government. So uh, just to, again, illustrate about our findings, and this is not related just to, to elections, it's a constant, uh, that, for example, in news program uh, at the channels uh, with the, you know, like traditional media that coverage the national frequency, um, actually, the uh, representation of the government and pro-government uh, 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 people is 95% versus 5% of the opposition representation. And then it's not just about uh, amount or how heavily they are presented, it's about the tone. So majority of government representatives are actually represented in a positive tone, neutral and positive tone. And when we come to this 5% uh, dedicated to opposition, we are actually see them almost all time in negative, uh, presented in negative tone. So uh, again, you know, like uh, when we talk about information environment, then manipulation of facts, disinformation are heavily presented. And uh, again, just to mention government, constant government attempts to suppress critical and independent voices. So this is very important when you link and you know, like when you try to illustrate what's going on in the, in the campaign uh, during the elections. So um, it is important to monitor the media before campaign starts because there is uh, certain legislative requirements that uh, actually artificially creates pluralism in media. And then, you know, like what we noticed, and we had the three elections in the same time, presidential, uh, parliamentary elections, and the uh, capital city, Belgrade elections, um, we actually saw that Beside that, that the, the, the fake or artificial pluralism is created, or you know, like it was just the exercise of ticking the box because of these leg legislative requirements, um, we see that this, uh, you know, like disinformation presence, especially you know, like uh, uh, with the right-wing political parties, actually dominated the uh, the media. Um, so, as I said, disinformation is one of the biggest problems. Uh, problems. Um, the thing about the uh, Ukraine uh, that significantly um, um, actually affects our campaign, uh, it's a question, or now we see how the government actually uh, used the Ukraine circumstances to actually gain the points and the right-wing parties who are actually glorifying the Russia actually use this fertile uh, grounds for spreading this information uh, constantly during the, the campaign. So uh, Ukraine actually overshadowed the all other topics. And uh, with this capture media and the position of the government that is trying to actually say that uh, Serbia is neutral when we come to uh, Ukraine and the war in Ukraine, uh, we see that actually this information dominated uh, in both traditional and online media. 
um, beside uh, Ukraine and the glorification of uh, Russia. Uh, another topic that was uh, really present when we come to disinformation was uh, economy. Again, economy to you know, like glorify, but not promote, glorify the work of the government and then uh, also in the same time to attack when we talk uh, uh, of the opposition accounts. When we, when we talk about the engagement in content, um, the comments were you know, like the, the thing that was you know, like, uh, um, used by... Uh, uh, by people, but also sharing, you know, like, and then uh, the further research is needed to understand actually whether this is the, the bot pattern, because, you know, like, uh, those comments on the content was really like almost the same messages with uh, uh, little changes, and the sharing was really heavily presented. So I'm like happy to answer on all your questions. I hope I you know, like answer the, the main question. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> Thanks, Luca. Um, Kyle, so <clears throat> people are watching uh, Brazil's upcoming elections closely, um, and I know it, democratic institutions in the country are mobilizing to thwart malign efforts to um, uh, undermine confidence in the process, including the TSC, the election, the main election management body um, in the country, kind of doing kind of pre-bunking um, of narratives and developing partnerships with tech platforms. Um, what aspects of the upcoming elections do you think are most vulnerable um, to disinformation and how are electoral actors planning around that? Um, and, you know, in your opinion, what kind of mitigation techniques have been particularly effective? Okay, great, great important questions. Um, so jumping directly to the first part of the question, um, the vulnerabilities. So I'd say the main vulnerability in Brazilian elections right now stems from a dichotomy. Uh, well, the elections are run by the electoral courts, so basically their legitimacy derives from statutes, from the Constitution. And the networked, concerted efforts targeting democracy, uh, they use social mobilization exactly to target legitimacy, and this, this information plays an important role there. And this is also valid for other aspects of our democracy. I'll give you a COVID example, so not, not electoral. Our public health system is, is more than a public service, really. It's, it's a system, uh, it's an inclusive, participative system. It's grounded on our constitution. You have experts, civil society, you have commissions to hear the population at the municipal, state, and federal level, super prepared uh, to deliver universal health care during the pandemic, then all of a sudden a network shows up. The military forces have an interest in getting funds and producing hydroxychloroquine in their labs. Uh, private companies want to import Sputnik without the authorization of our regulatory agencies. The president sees an opportunity for populism and pity, pitting people against the experts. Another hospital sees the opportunity to produce bogus research and justify all this. Disinformation legitimizes stepping outside of the existing public democratic system and turning towards private solutions, which we know that there's a flurry of interests there, but there is a shared interest in sidestepping democracy. Um, so I think we have a similar case in the elections. Uh, another point of pride of Brazilian democracy is the fact that we use electronic voting since the 90s. We never had an issue with our ballots. They've been audited, they've been tested. We have very tense elections and they've been tested and retested. Um, and, you know, it's the few things that work and we're, we're proud of. But it's also something that is highly complex. It's grounded on norms. Most of the population does not understand how the ballot ballots work, the information security aspects, the fact that they're not connected to the network, they're encrypted, they have all of these security measures which are highly technical, and surely the experts that audit it understand it, but the population does it. And that makes it easy for disinformation to target that, right? And legitimize, legitimize again, a solution outside of the system, such as a populist authoritarian attack. So moving on to the solutions and a few interesting things, two interesting things that uh, we've been seeing and that the electoral courts have been promoting. 
which I'm, I'm calling, let's say, a hybrid institution. So again, they're highly dependent on the norm. You know, the Constitution is a beautiful text. But they decided to bring everyone to the table and draft agreements, starting by platforms, Facebook, well, Meta, uh, TikTok, Google, and even Telegram, they brought, which is a first and a big achievement. Yeah. So they brought everyone to the table and said, well, great, we're, you're really welcome to work in Brazil. This is a democratic country. If you want to stay here, you need to agree with our, with our elections and you need to help protect it. So drafting crisis mechanisms, quick responses, and so on. Then uh, the electoral courts also turned to civil society, uh, drafted a task force agreement, which we are a part of, uh, then with civil society and academia receiving information, measuring social media, uh, producing campaigns to inform the wider audience. We had the lowest registration of young voters in Brazilian history with a lot of celebrities, social media influencers. My co-founder, who's the world's fifth biggest YouTuber, participated in this. And we, all of these organizations together, we managed to swing from the lowest uh, registration numbers in history to the highest. So now we have the highest rate of youth joining and voting. Obviously, the, the crisis of democracy isn't solved, but it shows that by establishing this dialogue between institutions and the broader audience, and, and doing this three-way thing between experts, government, and, and audience, and the, the broad public, we can rebuild trust. The second solution, and I promise I'm heading towards the end, uh, it relates exactly to the COVID example I, I mentioned before. The Senate investigated the federal COVID-19 response. So we had hearings, we had people summoned to testify, and something really interesting happened. A bunch of social media accounts that showed up that were created after our presidential elections in 2018, satire accounts with hilarious names uh, and individuals as well, saw an opportunity to participate in this mechanism of, public, of, of holding people to account. So they dug the dirt on the people testifying. They hinted and suggested questions to the senators, to the point that the senators would turn to Twitter and say, hey guys, so-and-so is showing up. Uh, what did he say uh, in 2020 about the pandemic? What should I ask him? So it became what, what is a highly institutional mechanism uh, you know, Senate executive checks and balances, two powers, became this crowdsourced investigation. And just as a teaser, this is what we're, we at Vero are, want to leverage for the next election. We, we're, we're building something on that. But it, it's a hybrid form of accountability, which I also think is a very interesting solution that takes advantage of this network mo mobilization to, instead of uh, sidestep or, or hinder our institutions, to leverage them. So these are two solutions I think that are quite promising. We, we will have to see how it plays out. But I, I do believe this teaming up between institutions and networks can play at our favor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I'm really interested to see how the Telegram and TikTok, you know, kind of participation shakes out. That's something where we know in a lot of places repeat offenders who have been removed from some of the more mainstream platforms have found homes on, on Telegram. And, and so I'm glad to see that they're there in the fold. Um, Anise, I know you're currently working um, with nonpartisan civic groups in Tunisia to safeguard the upcoming elections. Um, are, you know, the politics of post-revolution Tunisia are always changing. Um, in what way do you see kind of digitization influencing the upcoming elections? And in particular, how are civil society, you know, how is civil society sort of working um, to be uh, to push for electoral, electoral accountability and um, reform. Yeah, thank you. I mean, let me get back a little bit because I like telling stories. I mean, the, the, we, we always speak about the, the huge role that the uh, social media played in the Tunisian revolution. And back then, uh, Facebook in particular was a big tool for two things. One, sharing information and make sure that under that censorship, people were still getting their information about what was going on. And secondly, it was a very powerful tool for people to organize and to mobilize in the streets. Um, that led to toppling the regime uh, of, of the past dictatorship uh, of Ben Ali. And then that was the time when Tunisians were for the first time, at least for generations, 
uh, experiencing a real freedom of expression. So um, that freedom of expression over those social media tools, it was kind of a revolution uh, for, for, for the Tunisians uh, in two ways, both at the level of the engagement between citizens where people could engage with, with each other and discuss aspects or things that matter, uh, both politically but even for the Tunisian society, that are not dictated by a media or not dictated by a certain, a certain line. So that was quite a big thing. And the second thing is the possibility of engaging with decision makers and the possibility with an ease communication with the uh, uh, political actors. And that was really the way that the Tunisians opened their eyes to this uh, freedom of expression over, over social media. However, on the other hand, um, with time, um, users got somehow clustered in, in very homogeneous uh, uh, groups of people sharing almost the exact same point of view uh, with very little challenges to the way that they, they see things. And that contributed to a certain polarization in the Tunisian society. Uh, unfortunately, that also showed that uh, it, it developed a certain like extreme narratives um, which were uh, misused by certain political actors in order to kind of deepen uh, that, uh, that gap between the, the, the Tunisians and between the people that were engaging in, in, in politics. Uh, so it led to that situation where populist movements grew in Tunisia based on, on that, uh, on that uh, situation. Um, so, I mean, that, there were both a positive and negative aspect on that. Um, about the, the direct aspect of, of how it was impacting the elections, of course, it was a very powerful tool for getting the information and for mobilizing voters. But at the same time, like the recent 2019 presidential elections were very negatively impacted uh, by that very famous um, uh, Cartage operation affair where there were almost 900 pages, groups, uh, fake accounts um, that were mobilized in a kind of a coordinated uh, uh, campaign for exaggerated information and misleading information that was attacking on certain uh, political opponents and, and political actors. Um, and it ended up by even expanding after the, the presidential election to other countries, which was the same firm doing that in Togo, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, uh, etc. Um, and by the way, there is a very good uh, report uh, on that situation about, uh, that DFR Lab has, has uh, published. Um, what's the role of civil society in all this? Uh, citizen observer groups in Tunisia and elsewhere has been playing a very important role in safeguarding the integrity of the elections. Um, they do field observation, they do deploy people, citizens, independent citizens, in order to observe all the electoral processes and they are playing their role in assessing the electoral processes, in making sure that they do inform the public about how the elections is going, but also in engaging in the reform process and making recommendations and being really there for making sure that next elections uh, will be better. And in the recent years, um, civic groups and, and citizen observers has, have realized how um, impactful the information environment online uh, was on the integrity of the elections and in the inclusiveness of the, of the electoral processes. So citizen gr observer groups have been in innovatively thinking about also how to assess that aspect of the elections uh, that was having that huge impact on the, on the integrity of the, uh, of the elections. So it was following the same approach of, uh, as you all know, elections is not only about a voting day, it's an entire process. It's made of several steps, and each one of them has an impact on the integrity of the elections and its outcome. So they've been observing the information environment or assessing the information environment based on that long-term observation in the pre-election period, trying to assess how it can impact the outcome. You can see how voter registration can impact, how campaign can impact the outcome of the elections. Uh, election day, of course, and after the election day uh, with how results are being accepted and what are the narratives that are targeting the credibility of, of the results. Um, and even international election observation missions have been including that assessment of the information environment um, in, their, in their work. So very briefly, and I'll finish here, um, the, the civil society groups and citizen observers 
still do need much more to continue doing the work that they're doing. They're in independently assessing the elections, um, and they need better access to, ad to, to Facebook ads. They need better access to metadata, and, and they need to be considered by, by the big tech firms as real stakeholders contributing to the integrity of, of the elections that can provide that contextual knowledge of how the information environment and how these big firms are contributing to it uh, at, at, at the local level. So there is a big role that the civil society can play in that. They are trusted in their countries as independent observers, so they, they should have a bigger role in advocating for a better information ecosystem. Great, thank, thank you. you. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. I see one has come in virtually, so or we have a few. Um, so this first one is for VUCA. Um, when it comes to legislative requirements for pluralism in the media, what do you see as the fix? How can it be overcome if a government with an authoritarian verb forces the artificial um, this sort of information you refer to? Shall we pick up all the questions and then to answer all me too. Um, yeah, we can. Uh, let's see what the... Okay, so, and the, our next question is, since elections are time-sensitive issues, what steps should platforms take ahead of time to ensure online spaces remain balanced and reliable during election periods? And do we have any other questions? We can kind of throw them. Yep. I have a question for Rukusawa. Uh, I'm coming from Montenegro, so we are neighbors. <laughs> Uh, good yeah. to see you here. So, um, uh, in your opinion, when the Balkan, Western Balkan societies will be mature enough so we can say uh, our countries have an electoral integrity? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the question is when? Yeah, when. And which way? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Those are some big questions. So we can... Okay, one of Vuka, do you want to start yeah, and then we can... Yeah, let's start uh, <laughs> briefly. I see we don't have so much uh, time. So, uh, well, about the legislative requirements during the official uh, campaign, uh, what we measured and what we saw that didn't bring actually um, increase in, you know, like informing citizens objectively. Because the thing is that, you know, like when you have in media with the national frequency, this, for example, half an hour for all representatives to actually present their messages. This is so boring <laughs> that people are just, you know, like uh, clicking and you know, like moving the program, not following that. And then what they are interested in is actually to follow the news uh, part of the program where you have government dominates as I as I mentioned heavily So I mean like this way is not helping and uh, it's really good to hear and many things that on these panels were actually discussing about how uh, What are the benefits when you have civil society and government you know like and other parts and actors in democratic society when they collaborate when they you know like work together Currently, if we talk about, you know, like uh, uh, organizations that are trying to really to defend democracy, the collaboration is not possible. Although international community is pushing us to collaborate, which means giving up from the main values that you are actually promoting. So the question from my neighbor, you know, like in Montenegro, is about you know, like building democracy in our countries. You know, like it's about the values. And this is what we actually are very angry when we talk about international communities, especially the West countries, who are turning the blind eye on what we have in Serbia right now. You can't sit on all chairs glorifying Russia and in the same time undermining the West, you know, like uh, attempts to, uh, uh, to do what they do. So I'm just saying that, you know, like when we build enough, you know, like the political culture, when we, you know, like build the, the demand side for real democracy, I mean, like the question about when is really difficult when you have so heavily present disinformation, pro-Russian actors in, in our country. So I think we will need time. But the very important message is actually, if we lose the EU perspective, you know, I think we will not be able to democratize Serbia. Thank you. 
And then maybe um, a question for maybe the rest of the panel, uh, so a about sort of how the platforms can plan ahead around elections, and maybe when should that be happening, and what should that look like? Ellen, I bet you have some thoughts. <laughs> I do. Actually, I'd like to talk about an issue that is very in the weeds in the United States, and I'm not sure uh, whether this happens in other countries, but there's this phenomenon of micro-targeting, where, uh, and I, I imagine it actually does exist in other countries, because it's part of the platform's business model. They suck all this data out of all of our clicks and our likes, and they use that to sell ads, as Mark Zuckerberg uh, famously said to uh, a Senate panel once. Uh, Senator, we sell ads. That's how we make money. Uh, the problem for democracy is when they're selling these very micro-targeted ads where they, they use all this data that they have accumulated in order to sell um, uh, to their advertisers, we can, we can find the most susceptible audience for your message. And just you can, you can make sure that your message only goes to the people who are most likely to be receptive to it. And the problem with that is that nobody else sees it. So one of the basic premises of our uh, uh, free speech principles in the United States is, well, if you don't like what somebody else is saying, then you should come up with a better message. And, and in the marketplace of ideas, your message will win if it really is better. But you cannot contest somebody else's information, their disinformation, if you never see it. So uh, one proposal that I have made to the, uh, to the platforms is that when they are engaging in this business model, when they're selling their ads, they should make sure that they are um, uh, going to a broad enough range of people that they will be available for debate, and that not only the people who are most likely to say, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me, no matter how crazy the idea is, uh, uh, they will not be uh, in their own little bubbles there where nobody else gets access to the information and is able to uh, put forth the counter arguments. So that's my, my uh, small scale uh, issue. But you know, I wanted to circle back to a, a larger issue that I am really fundamentally very concerned about, and that is just faith in democracy. Mm -hmm. Democracy rests on faith. As, as uh, one of my co-panelists said, you know, this, it's very technical running an election. People don't really understand how it works. But for over 200 years, people in the United States have believed that the public-spirited, nonpartisan, professional, you know, these boring little bureaucrats who sit there and they compose the ballots and they count the ballots, that they're doing their job professionally. And when they announce the results, they are right. And, and, you know, you win some, you lose some. If you lose, then you say, okay, we'll do better next time. But I think that we are heading into a very dangerous time right now where people are unwilling to accept the, any results that they don't like. And their go-to response is becoming, well, the other side cheated, that it, it wasn't counted properly, there was fraud. There's no evidence for any of this. And again, I think the, the, me the social media platforms have a responsibility to not elevate these kinds of conspiracy theories because uh, I think we are barreling towards a place where, and it's a dangerous place for our democracy, where uh, nobody on either side is gonna trust the results if they lose and democracy can't function that way. Thank you. Any other final, but yeah, Kyle. Okay, so answering the question of what platforms should, should do, I, I don't think there's any space for uh, black, box black box decisions anymore. And I include here the algorithms which are, which are materializations of company decisions, right? We, we can get into the discussion of machine learning and so on, but at the end of the day, these are uh, organizational decisions. And uh, this black box issue, at the end of the day, comes back to bite. Uh, I, I can give another a, a good example of that. Back in 2018, uh, civil society and academia brought evidence that WhatsApp was being used uh, to spread misinformation in Brazil. Uh, the response from the company at the time was, oh no, you're moderating hundreds of groups, that's not representative, here's the numbers we have, we won't share the data, even though you're asking for it, but you know, believe me, that's not true. Fast forward a couple of, couple of years, evidence amounts we know it's true, WhatsApp is like, oh, maybe we should cooperate, and, and the company is doing a good job now in, in cooperating. But now, regulators are talking about 
very, very stringent regulations. Other groups want to piggyback right on that, including the media conglomerates that are saying, well, you know, let's not regulate the media. We have enough competition there. Let's regulate the social media platforms. In fact, let's make them pay for journalism, and we'll receive that money. So, you know, all these interest groups are taking advantage of the lack of trust that was built because of that defensive position. So uh, where I'm getting at is we need to have collaborations. Things like uh, Commissioner Vi Weintraub brought that the, the social media companies nudged, tweaked the algorithm uh, during elections. I think that's great, but we need to understand what's going on, what is the tweak, what are the blind spots. We need to have a better report there. So then we can have proper accountable and legitimate decisions. And, and that way we can keep a healthy ecosystem and not build or, or you know, leave a problem that will come back to bite us in a, in a few years. Okay, well, unfortunately, we are out of time, oh, but sorry, I wanted guys. to uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to thank our I'm panelists so sorry. Um, and, uh, and all the thoughtful questions as well. So, great. Thank you. I thought we, yeah.